Okay, okay. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good evening, everybody. How are we doing out there? I just wanted to make sure that we were all going live right here. Looks like we are live. It uh, looks like I'm live now. Okay. It uh, looks like I had some little issues that told me it wasn't online, but now it told me that we are live. So want to just bless you guys for being here. Thank you for joining us for another Monday Moments in Time. Uh, this one is going to be titled, We're Going to Have Some Fun with Our Bibles. Uh, today is January 17th, uh, 2022. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yes, we're going to have some fun with our Bibles, and I couldn't wait to uh, do this teaching. It looks like we've kind of wrapped up the uh, teaching that I was doing last week. So if you uh, haven't seen the last two that I did, please go back and take a look at those. They were really, really good. If I do say so myself, the Lord, I think, really used uh, us in delivering that uh, teaching. So uh, take a look at it. Uh, it. It is confirmed that we are worshiping the correct Jesus and we actually break it down and show it to you. So uh, let me go ahead and remove uh, these banners here. and We can get started. Here we go. So I am I'm trying to be fancy. I've got two monitors going. And by the way, I, I couldn't wait to do this uh, teaching tonight. I am making a sacrifice. Uh, as many of you know, I'm an avid L.A. Rams fan and my Rams are playing right now in the playoffs against the Cardinals. But hey, you know what? I'm going to be right here uh, teaching the word of God. <laughs> so uh, but uh, just give me 30 minutes. And if you are watching the game, you can go back and watch the game in 30 minutes. So we'll go ahead and get started. Let me uh, share my screen. I'm being fancy here. I've got two monitors going this time. There we go. So let's share that one right there. Okay, now I'm sharing my screen here. Okay, yes, yeah, pretty cool having two monitors. All right, well, the good thing is I can actually see comments uh, as they are coming in. So let me go ahead and get us started and open up for prayer. Father, I thank you that you always hear us when we pray. Lord, I pray that I am delivering the message that you, I feel you gave me to give, Lord. I want this to be a fun Bible study tonight. And if I don't finish tonight, Lord, then we can always pick it up again next Monday. You know, if you, if you have that in your will. But I pray that I've heard you correctly and that we've answered these questions, Lord, that have been put uh, before us and, and other teachers uh, besides me. I pray for everyone that is joining. I pray for everyone that will be joining. And I, Lord, I pray for those who will be watching the recorded version of this. In Jesus' name, Lord, cover us, Lord, and keep us safe and keep us protected. And Lord, protect our joy and our peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Okay, so we've got the first lady here. There's the first lady. All right, and we got my mother-in-law here. Bless God. All right, okay. So this is this might work out pretty cool with these two monitors because I can actually show the comments as they come in. So let's get started. Let's have some fun uh, with our Bibles, okay? First thing I want to do is I do want to recognize that today we are honoring Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, there's a, a teaching I want to do on him. Uh, maybe in a couple of weeks I want to do one on him. But I'm just going to uh, preface today's teaching by just mentioning that if you didn't already know that uh, Dr. King was born January 15th, 1929 in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he had passed away uh, April 4th, 1968. At the young age of 39, a very young man at 39 years old in Memphis, Tennessee. Of course, the cause of death was an assassination uh, bullet. Uh, Dr. King did more for this world and this nation and for the people of color during the Jim Crow era than any other preacher or social activist to this day. Uh, that's what I want to do in one of my teachings. Is I want to actually show the uh, the accomplishments that Dr. King uh achieved and the amazing part is we can take some of these things for granted because we are living in a post Jim Crow era but for Dr. King to have put forth the effort and to do what he did and to accomplish what he did during Jim Crow where it was illegal to be an African American if you were a person of color it was illegal 
but it was, and I was born, you know, after Jim Crow. So obviously I didn't go through that, but I've talked to my dad and my grandfathers and I've talked to my mother and other people, uh, just talked to a, a, a relative uh, in law a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually last weekend and had a good conversation about how he endured Jim Crow and what I can do and my generation can do in this day and time. But yeah, during a time where the color of your skin, the amount of melanin in your skin made you illegal. <clears throat> great conversation. So thank God for that. But that's the teaching I want to do uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, there is something I want to do. I felt led to do this. I was watching a, a couple of stories. You want the iPad? Okay. He's talking to first lady over here. I was watching uh, a, a couple of interesting conversations out with some people. I wasn't involved in the conversation, but I it, it pained me deeply to hear people like this uh, state what they were um, declaring. And so what I wanted to do tonight, if you are not born again, or if you have left the church because someone has wronged you in the church, I wanted to take this time and say and acknowledge that there are many angry and hurting people who are just fed up with the Christian church. And <clears throat> Even though it, it it does not mean that I can isolate myself because I haven't, that I know of, done this to anyone. Uh, when I had my uh, building church, uh, I didn't kick anyone out. I didn't uh, ask anyone to leave. I, I, I didn't uh, discourage people from coming. But just because I didn't do it does not mean that when people hear I'm a pastor that I'm not held accountable and that people don't look at me because of that. So... I may not have done it directly, but indirectly when people hear that I'm a, a pastor of the gospel of Jesus Christ, they put me in that lump together. So if they're going to do that, then let me take this time and say on behalf of Christian preachers everywhere, I want to take this time to apologize to any and everyone who has been hurt by a church member or someone in church leadership. You know, it, it was wrong. Uh, I, I want to go on to say that there are and were those that we as the church turned away who we should have accepted and actually embraced and likewise there were and actually are those right now who we have accepted and embraced who we should have turned away and i want to acknowledge that and i want you to know that i acknowledge that and to let you know that yes as a body of christ we were wrong don't turn your back on Jesus because he was not wrong. He never made a mistake. We did. So if you were hurting and you never received an apology, please allow me to apologize for what happened to you. <clears throat> it really pained me to see these people of different uh, nationalities, uh, different uh, generations that are angry and hurt by what they endured uh, in the name of the Lord uh, by Christians, people I would just say Christians that may not have meant well, did not know what they were saying or doing. And there are people who are really hurting right now who are fed up with the Christian church. And I wish I could have gone through the screen to talk to these people and explain, you know, I apologize. We are to imitate Christ. We're not to imitate Christians. And yes, you were done wrongly. But if you know someone like that, let them know that there is at least one. And I know there's many. I'm, I'm not some anomaly, but let them know that there are preachers who are apologizing for what they uh, have endured by other Christians. <clears throat> so let's kind of change gears and let's have some fun. We can see how, how much we can get through with this. I actually know, because I went through the teaching, that we may not have time all of the time today, which is okay, because there are some things that I want to bring out that I do not want to rush through. Uh, First Lady, as well as a, a relative of mine, <laughs> uh, let me know. You know, when you get excited, you talk really fast, and you probably could have broken that last teaching down into two teachings. Uh, so just kind of slow down when you get all excited. So I'm going to try to do that. Uh, so if I talk a little bit slower, it's because I'm trying to calm myself down. There are some great things that are in the Bible. And uh, I just, I find new things whew, in the word all the time. So with that in mind, let's answer some commonly asked questions that have come across our table. Maybe they've come across your table and you didn't know quite how to answer these questions. Uh, we hope this will help.
And uh, if you have questions that we haven't answered, please uh, send them on. And for those of you, continue sending us your questions. OK, so let's get started. Uh, here's a question. Is the Earth millions of years old or 7,000 years old? People have this question a lot. And I wanted to take the time to answer this question um, right now in Genesis chapter 1. I want to give you a chance to get your Bible or open up your phone. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verses 1 through 5. There we go. I've got my two monitors going. Let me just acknowledge that my mother is here. So I'm glad you're here as well, Mama. I'm glad you're here. But is the earth millions of years old or 7,000 years old? So if you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible states in the beginning, and I love that word beginning because, you know, God has no beginning nor an end, but he allowed that word to be used for us because our time on this planet had a what's called beginning. But in the beginning, God created the heavens. And you'll notice I've got these little marks in here, this little symbol, because when I put that in there, I'm, that's kind of like a pause between that time of in the beginning, God created the heavens to the next uh, part, because there could have been a million or a year. It could have been a zillion years between God creating the heavens and then he created the earth. So we don't know how long it was between God creating the heavens and then God creating the earth. And it goes on to say that the earth was formless. Okay, so for a time it was formless. And then for a time it was empty. And then for a time darkness covered the deep waters. Where did the waters come from? When did the waters appear? These deep waters. So you have to kind of look at the at, at this word and say, well, when the Lord created the earth and it was formless, first it was empty, but then sometime in alien years, we'll call it, he created not just waters, but deep waters. Then it says, how long was it after he created the deep, the deep waters, did his spirit hover over the surface of the waters? So, and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now, after that, how long did it take for God to say, let there be light? Once the light formed and he said, and there was light, how long did it take? That could have taken a thousand years or a million years. This is why it's not really a good idea to get into debate with people. Was the earth millions of, millions of years or 7,000 years? We don't know how long it took between the different, that what we call verses of, of, of Genesis. And the Bible says, and God saw that the light was good. And the reason why I put that word in italic completed because that's what the word means. And God saw that the light was good. It was completed. This was enough light. And what light was it? Was it the light of the sun? It was the light all over our known and unknown galaxy. It was completed. How long after that? Then it says, then he separated the light from the darkness. So you can see you could go on and on showing, wow, it could have taken a million or a billion or a quintillion amount of years to actually form this earth and to get everything on earth. Or it could have taken the Lord, you know, uh, seven days. It could have taken six days. And on the seventh day, because uh, uh, one year to God is as a thousand years, no, which is no problem. But that starts after the first day. So see, when you keep going and it says he separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day and the darkness night. How long after that did it say an evening passed? And then the morning came. Now you're marking the first day. So now you have this day. So again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but I hope this answers your question where you kind of have a, you know, uh, a pretty good answer for how old is the earth? And again, no one knows but God how old the earth really is. It could be thousands of years old or it could be millions of years old. It, we just don't know between the time of when he was forming the planet and the galaxies and the known and unknown galaxies. So I hope that helps. Let's go to another one. Who created the planet? 
uh, God or Jesus? I've seen this question a lot. Uh, and it's so funny because uh, when, when you have somebody ask you who created the planet, uh, was it God or Jesus? I know they're talking about Jesus because of the book of John, which I brought up uh, on here. And when you look at was it God, because in Genesis it says, and God said, and God said. Uh, and I, I laugh at that because, you know, you have to understand that there that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So what one does, the other one is doing, uh, because you can't separate them, just like I'm Tony Tillman. I am Antonio Timothy Tillman. Uh, I am El Tonio to only one person on this world, and that's my wife, and I'm Twan to only two people on this planet, my two cousins, Kenny and Eric. But I am a husband to Victoria. I'm also a son to Ravonda, and I'm also a cousin to, let's say, Kenny. I'm the same person, but I've got three different roles. So same thing. Now, if you really want to break it down, the Bible clearly shows you, and that's what this uh, teaching is going to be about tonight. It shows you that in Genesis 1, chapter 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 6, then God said, let there be a space between the waters. So what I'm going to pause on is when you look at then God said, when God says anything, his word must go forth. And you may say, okay, Tony, I get it. His word must go forth. It looks like our word must go forth. Exactly. However, if you really want to get deep with that, when you have to go to the book of John to say, okay, what is the point of you saying God's word went forth? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning, the word already existed. Now, what does that mean? The word was with God and the word was God. Then it shows you he, who he, the word existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him. Who was him? The word. Who was the word? Jesus. So God created everything through Jesus and nothing was created except through him. That means nothing that we can see on this planet, known and unknown, was created without Jesus. Wherever you see the word gave life to everything. That is another name for Jesus gave life to everything that was created. And his life brought light to everyone. And it defines that in verse 10, when you go down, he came into the very world he created. So <laughs> the gospel of John tells you right there, and I could have just went to that one verse, but it tells you who created the planet. Jesus came to the very world he created but the world didn't even recognize him. So the word, which is Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. So when you look at the Gospel of John, now you understand when it says, then God said, then God said, then God said. It's really amazing to think of that concept. Then God said, let there be light. Jesus created that light right then and there. So it, it, it's really amazing. And I, I, I could spend another teaching on that, but, but that answers that question. Uh, technically speaking, Jesus created everything we are looking at today. Uh, however, you can't separate Jesus from God because Jesus is God. And you can't separate Jesus and God from the Holy Ghost because they're all one. Just like you are three people. You're someone's son. You're someone's father. And you're someone's brother or uncle or cousin. You're someone's mother. You're someone's daughter. You're someone's sister or aunt or cousin. Just different roles for different people, for different ones, different purposes. Oh, here's one of my favorite ones. Why did God say he loved Jacob? but he hated Esau, if he is a God of love? <laughs> I love getting this question. So why did God say he loved Jacob? Now, uh, if you look at the book of Malachi, this is where you'll find Malachi chapter one in the King James, where it says, uh, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Verse two, it says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, wherein have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob and I hated Esau. 
and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now, I have no, you know me, I always do this disclaimer. I love the King James, <laughs> okay? I would never tell you to turn away or, or throw away your King James Bible. But when you look at the New Living Translation, again, what the, the, the NLT, the original manuscripts, it, it's not an emotional feeling that God had towards Jacob and Esau. If you look at the New Living Translation, what it says is Malachi chapter one, verse one through three. This is the message that the Lord gave to Israel through the prophet Malachi. I have always loved you, says the Lord, but you retort, really? How have you loved us? And the Lord replies, this is how I showed my love for you. I love selected your ancestor, Jacob. But I rejected his brother Esau and devastated his hill country. I turned Esau's inheritance into a desert for jackals. You may be like, whoa, wait a minute. So it's not an emotional feeling, but what God is saying, God said, I selected Jacob to be in covenant, not just with me, but with the children of Israel and everyone that intends to be blessed is going to be blessed and come from the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You're not going to hear me say the God of Esau. That is not where the covenant is going to come from. King David is not going gonna, not gonna to come through the lineage of Esau. King David, all the way down to Jesus. Is not Jesus did not come from the lineage of Esau. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus came through the lineage of King David, who came through the lineage of Jacob, who came through Isaac, who came from Abraham. So that is why the Bible is stating that, but I don't want you to think that God hated Esau <coughs> because God didn't hate Esau. I'll say this much, God loved him, but he wasn't pleased with him. And we're going to go through that because I was doing this teaching and I think there's some interesting things you're going to, I hope you find it interesting. I always check with first lady when I get done with the teaching to, to see, okay, am I, am I nerding people out on the Bible? Was it interesting? Because I find these things fascinating because they're connected to what is going on today. So let me continue. Why didn't God select Esau? We're going to get to that answer a little bit later. Esau, I don't know if you've ever done a teaching on Esau or been a part of a teaching on Esau, but I'm going to get to that. Um, but that's what it meant. So it wasn't a matter of emotion. God selected Jacob, but he did not select Esau for a number of reasons. Now, why did God not only allow Jacob to steal Esau's birthright, but God seemed to honor Jacob for doing it? And we're going to go over that story, how uh, Jacob took uh, Esau's birthright. And I could answer that question in one sentence. So, Tony, why did God not only allow Jacob to steal Esau's birthright, but God seemed to honor Jacob for doing it? Oh, that's easy, because Esau showed contempt for his rights as being the firstborn. Really? Well, can you prove that? Not a problem. We are playing with our Bible tonight. <laughs> Turn to Genesis 20, uh, 25. Genesis chapter 25, and I'm starting at verse number 20. So it starts off with uh, when Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have any children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. Mm. You have none, now you got two. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told Rebecca, look, the sons in your womb will become two nations. Now I'm gonna just take a little pause right here. I know I'm, I'm getting away from time, but this is very important. This is how I'm going to start the foundation of this teaching on, on uh, Jacob and Esau. The Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. That's, that's key right there. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. 
one nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. You may figure, wait, I don't know, why is that a big deal? Because when you have twins like this, or not really twins, when you have more than one male child, the older child, he gets everything. It's his birthright to get everything. And the younger children always serve the older child. But what the Lord is saying here is one nation will be stronger than the other. Okay, I got you there. I know what that means. And your older son will serve your younger one. That's different. Then the Lord goes on to say, and when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did have twins. I guess she didn't. She doubted. So the first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like, like a fur coat. So they named him Esau and Esau means hair. That's why they named him Esau. He's the, he's the older child. Now, then the other twin was born with his hand holding on to his brother's feet, to his heel. <laughs> So they named him Jacob. Now the name of Jacob means heel. It means deceiver. It means to be a trickster. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. Now, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay home. So you can see that Esau became his daddy's son, and then Jacob became kind of like a mama's boy. Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game that Esau brought home. But it says Rebecca loved Jacob. So it, it kind of shows you, you could even use that word here, select. You could, you, you could um, what I was saying about God uh, loving Jacob and hating Esau. And I say it selected, God selected Jacob, but rejected uh, Esau. You could use that here. Isaac selected Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game. Uh, Rebecca selected Jacob. So same type of thing. One day when Jacob was cooking some stew, so Jacob was at home cooking, Esau arrived home from the wilderness exhausted and hungry. Esau told his brother Jacob, look, man, I'm starving. Give me some of that stew you have over there, that red stew. Now, this is also how Esau got his other name, Edom, which I'll get to another teaching, obviously, which means red. Edom means red. Put a note by that and just kind of keep that in mind. So Jacob said, all right, but trade me your rights as the firstborn son. <laughs> Esau said, look, man, I'm starving over here. I'm dying. OK, what good is my birthright to me right now? But Jacob said, first, you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all of his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Read that for yourself, verse number 34. The Bible says, then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal. And then he got up and left and he showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. So that is key number one. If you're writing and taking notes, that's key number one, why the Lord rejected Esau. When the Lord gives you something, don't show contempt for it. That is what happened with Esau. That, that's key number one. And it, there are other things. But if you're wondering again, I've always wondered, why did God not like Esau? Well, this is part of the reason right here, because God looked in the future and he saw that Esau did not care about a free gift that God gave him. It's amazing. Salvation is a free gift. We get that through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm looking at the time and I want to con uh, I want to cover one more topic and then we'll stop for today. I knew I wasn't going to be able to get finished with this and it's too important to rush. So let me just cover one more part of this with Jacob and Esau. OK, I'm going to go right now to the Bible that I, I study from because what I want to show you. Let's see here. There we are. OK, so I won't read all of this because it's entirely too long. It's Genesis chapter 26, 27 and 28. But I'm going to just briefly give you kind of the high notes that Isaac deceives Abimelech. So 
A famine struck the land, and the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Don't go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you to do. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I'll be with you and bless you. I'll cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'll do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements. So Isaac stayed in Gerara, he was. And when the man uh, lived there who asked Isaac about his wife, Rebecca, he got scared and he said, she's my sister, you know, and he didn't want to say that she was my wife. And so it turns out that um, they were going to, uh, th this king was going to, uh, you know, take Rebecca as his wife and, and lay with her. But immediately uh, Abimelech, this king of the Philistines, called for Isaac and said, hey, she's obviously your wife. <laughs> okay. Why did you lie to me? I was afraid you would kill me just to get, you know, to her. So he kind of goes off on Isaac. And then uh, Abimelech uh, actually did a public proclamation. Anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. So now you kind of fast forward and Isaac is planting crops. And there's a big conflict between the people he's living around because they've got flocks of sheep and goats and cattle. And there's um, there's a big conflict about, hey, whose who's well is this? Whose water is this? This is our water. No, this is our water. This is our. So there was a big fight about that. So Isaac resolved that with them and the Lord was with him on that. And so eventually Isaac had to go. OK, now. Isaac made covenant with Abimelech. And I'm going through this story with you. You may be wondering, Tony, where are you going with this? I'm going through this story with you because you've got to watch what the Bible did. The Bible did something when the Holy Ghost was narrating this to Moses. And you, if you don't really catch it again, you can't just read the Bible. You have to read the Bible. You have to ask, why? wait, what just happened? So let me let me continue. So let me start at verse... Um, 30. And this is how Isaac is going to start uh, creating this covenant between him and Abimelech. So Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate the treaty, and they ate and drank together. Early the next morning, they each took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. Then Isaac sent them home again, and they left him in peace. That very day, Isaac's servants came and told him about a new well they had dug. We have found water. They were so excited. <clears throat> So Isaac named the well Sheba, which means oath. And to this day, the town that grew up there is called Beersheba, which means well of the oath. That's verse 33. Watch when I go to verse 34. At the age of 40, Esau married two Hittite wives, Judith, the daughter of Beeri, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon. But Esau's wives made life miserable for Isaac and Rebekah. I have to stop there, <laughs> okay, because I want to explain this. Uh, just I want to talk about how the Bible took this quick turn, but I don't want to go into uh, Esau and this because what Esau started to do, again, if you want to write something down, this is strike number two, why God rejected Esau. And that's why the Bible is talking about Okay, um, you got Isaac here. Isaac lied to this king about Rebecca. You know, he she he knew that Rebecca was his wife, but he was afraid Abimelech was going to kill him. So he lied and said Rebecca was his sister. And then once they, you know, made up and everything and, and, and the king made a proclamation, nobody better touch this man or his wife. Now everything is good. But then there's a problem because there are sheep and goats and cattle that have to be watered. And Abimelech's people and um, Isaac's people are fighting over the uh, short amount of whales in that area. So Isaac is digging whales and they're getting blessed. You know, he's getting blessed by digging all these whales. And so him and the king forge another treaty, okay, if you will. And this treaty is, is when they are going to say, okay, we're going to, you, you go your way and you, you live here, I live here. We won't, you know, put dirt in your whales and this kind of thing. And then you fast forward and Isaac's people says, hey, we found a new whale. Isaac names that whale. And all is the whole topic is talking about Isaac and the whales. All of a sudden, without any warning, the Bible takes an immediate hard right and says, at the age of 40, Esau married two Hittite wives, Judith 
and base math. And Esau's wives made life miserable for his dad and his mother. Wait, 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 Lord, where'd that come from? Why did that happen? That's where we're going to stop right now. Because I want, I, I want to spend more time with that. And it might take me about a good half hour to an hour to cover that. And I don't want to keep you guys like that. But if you want to, you know, if you want to jump ahead and play with your Bible, I, read Genesis. Let's see. I, I wonder how far can you go? Read Genesis 26, 27, and 28 as homework if you want to do that. If not, I'm going to cover it next Monday. But everybody, it, I'm, I'm really excited about going over this. And I know if I continue, I'm going to talk real fast and I'm going to have to slow down and I want to create some more pictures for you. But trust me, everything that we are going through right now, today, January 17th, 2022, what's going on in this world right now is because we've got two brothers fighting. We've got Jacob still fighting with Esau. And this was foretold by God a long time ago. And God had told men what to do about it. But coming up, men didn't listen to God. They listened to their own their own word. And this is where we end up today. So those of us that are in America, we're not directly going or affected by this. We are indirectly affected by what went on. But those of you watching me from other countries in the Middle East, you are very much directly going through issues because of these two brothers fighting. And I'm going to bring this up, you know, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept to show you this is why. So God bless you guys. Um, um, let, me, uh, let me just ask right now and do an altar call if there's anyone out there. And this is not your traditional, uh, th this is actually a Bible study. I didn't do a teaching, but I want to do a Bible study <clears throat> for the next couple of weeks. But if you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, and hopefully, you know, with my craziness, I've gotten you more excited about at least learning about the Word than you were before. And you want to make Jesus a part of your life for now and forever. And I pray to God you make this decision. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I repent of my sins. I believe you died for me, and I believe you rose again. And I believe that you are sitting at the right hand of God. Mm. And I am now rapture ready in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> hey, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know that you are born again. And I'm going to start doing because the Lord has just given me so many different things to go over. It's like 2022 hit. And I don't I haven't run out of ideas or run out of messages. I, I, I have sometimes have to stop and just I, I, I got them on my iPad. I got them on my, my smartphone. I keep sending myself notes. But I want to do a teaching, and I want you guys to help me, uh, those of you who are already born again, you've been born again for a while, and you know people who are not born again that you're witnessing to, or you know people who just got born again. We have to be able to not only encourage them, but give them uh, lessons on what it means to be born again. Because sometimes we'll, we'll lead people to the Lord, say this prayer, they, they, they'll repeat the prayer, and then we're done with it. And they're like, okay, I got, I got born again. Now what? And that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll do a teaching. Uh, and I think I did one before, but we'll, we'll do one more in depth. I'm born again. Now what? Now what What do I do? And I know I did one before, but I want to expand on that. So, but to, hey, God bless you guys. Okay. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I'm going to pray us out of here because I want the Lord to bless you. I want his face to shine upon you. In your coming and in your going, I want his presence to go before you and behind you and beside you and all around you. May God's face shine upon you for a thousand generations and your children and their children and their children. Father, I thank you that you have heard us, Lord, <clears throat> when we pray. I pray, Father, that this teaching, albeit incomplete, but I pray that the portion that we covered accomplished what it was supposed to, Father. For your glory, Lord Jesus, I thank you for giving me not just the determination and the will, but also the 
I would just say the, the, the knowledge, Lord, to do this teaching. Thank you for giving me the giddiness to even get excited about teachings like this, Lord. I thank you, Father. And I pray, Lord, over every household represented that you show yourself strong in everybody here, Lord. And that they have questions, that they have answers now to their questions. Because we need to know about you. If we're going to call you our Father, our Lord, who art in heaven, we ought to know about you. So, Father, I pray that we get to know you more and more and come closer and closer to you. Because that's what you want and that's what we want. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Okay, everybody. Well, hey, God bless you. Thank you for being here, okay? I will see you next Monday, Lord willing, and we're going to continue right here. If you're going to read ahead again, Genesis 25, 26, 27, and 28. I did 25 already, but if you want to read 25, you can. If you don't want to read ahead, it is okay because I want to show you some things I'm happy about. There are men living today that have to do with this right here. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 34, that Esau married two Hittite wives. There are people living right now that are because of this verse. So we'll hit that next week. All right. God bless you guys. I'll see you. Let me stop because I could just keep going. <laughs> Love you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>